Hello, welcome to the Wellness Essentials Podcast. I am the host today, Patty Post, founder and CEO of Checkable Medical. And today we are talking with one of the advisors that we have had for Checkable Medical for years, Dr. Lester Hartman, who is a pediatrician that dedicated his professional career to his patients and families for 35 years. Dr. Hartman is a pediatrician and also a master's of public health from the School of Public Health at Harvard. He resides in Massachusetts in the greater Boston area and has been with Boston Children's for over 35 years now. He identifies as a Cajun as he grew up in Louisiana, and he is an advocate for our kids' health. And today what we are talking about is vaping and that this has really turned into a huge epidemic for families and for kids from the legislation, things that he has changed by being extremely involved. He gives us information today on books to read, on advocates that we should follow, on groups that we should be a part of as parents so we can keep ourselves informed and really sends the message that it is not too early to talk about vaping with your children. You can start as early as kindergarten to make them aware of it, that it is very serious because Our kids are extremely vulnerable to the fancy and creative marketing that these companies are putting forward. They are not targeting adults and they are not looking at it as a target for smoking cessation devices. They are looking for reoccurring tobacco users. And we now are finding new products such as pods, things like synthetic nicotine that isn't even derived from tobacco. It is brand new products such as Velo, such as Drift, another one with a number two, O-N-E. There are serious side effects to vaping. We have heard of the lung issues that pre-pandemic, we heard a lot more about this, but they are still very serious. He recommends talk to your pediatrician. So with that, this episode is going to be for parents of kids that are kindergarten through high school and really talking about the important subject of vaping. And if you suspect that your child is, what to do, the signs to look for, and how you can get involved so your kids are not targeted by this. So with that said, We will leave it to Dr. Hartman. Hope you enjoy. And please look for the items that we post of how you can educate yourself and be aware of all of the resources out there. Hey, this is the Wellness Essentials Podcast. We for short. The We Podcast is all things health and wellness a place where women like you can come to be their authentic selves and be a part of a community that supports them in their health journey and every stage of life. This is the podcast for engaging health and wellness entertainment with actionable steps you can take into your everyday life. No topic is off limits when it comes to health and women's lifestyle. Let's face it, being a woman comes with all sorts of fun. Hear real, raw conversations and teachings from experts and everyday women who have been in your shoes and get inspired to make things happen and have the tools to do so. This is the WE Podcast. I actually was shocked when I heard that you are going to retire because I thought this is his passion. But at the same time, I would expect it frees you up to do some of this research that you are so passionate about for that next generation of kids and making a difference for kids all over the U.S. and the standard, right? The standards that we that go through the government. Yes, it's the utilitarian philosophy, you know the greatest good for the greatest number. 
And that's where I feel I've landed. I was fortunate, you know, to go to the Harvard School of Public Health and get my master's in public health. And my public health leadership professor was a, an oral surgeon that was hugely involved in anti-vaping and was very innovative in the state of Massachusetts and nationally. He was the head of, um, I believe at one point, he was head of the Department of Public Health. And he pushed me along to get in this advocacy work. And it was more than enough for me because, as I found out in hindsight later, how much it has hugely affected my family personally, although that was not the total motive. It's for all kids, but having a mom die of a, a stroke at uh, 66 and have heart disease from age 50 on and autoimmune disorders, which are associated with cigarettes, even though people don't realize that. And also my nephew's son who died of sudden infant death syndrome after he started smoking at two months of age pass. And my mother smoked at least for part of the pregnancy with me. And I have a club foot and had learning disabilities. So school wasn't always Let's say it this way. School was fine. Behavior wasn't great. So, you know, it was an uphill battle. It's the classic description of an ADHD child before ADHD label ever existed in 1967, 68. And now we're, we've gone from cigarettes from the last century. And now in the 21st century, it's vape. And some of this stuff, it's what's interesting, even though it looks like Kuka, you, have, you can look at the Star Wars bar scenes and you can see the devices that they were smoking. And um, I don't think it was Star Wars' intent to, to market it, but that's what was on towards the end of the 20th century into the 21st century. So, wow. And I think that, you know, that was kind of the harbinger of what was to come and what is coming now. I just learned that the total amount of profit that's made per year in the world from tobacco, and it does, that doesn't just mean tobacco in cigarettes, but it means vape, gum, and there's a new gum called Lucy, we can talk about a little bit, and patches. It's uh, $825 billion a year wow. in profit. So it's almost a trillion dollars tobacco is and you know when we talk about tobacco it has to be with nicotine even though the companies are trying to split it so they can get around the law nicotine is tobacco by legal definition since it's extracted from the plant but now there's some synthetic type that they claim is not extracted from the plant that make up the newer generations of tobacco products i.e the dips that are being made like Zen, Drift, and 2-on, number two, and O-N-E, or 2-on. I can't two, quite keep up. 2-O-1-E, okay. Yes, and the other one that's been on TV advertised is Bello. Okay. Which um, is another, it's a pouch saying it's tobacco-free nicotine. And, um, you know, the problem with all this is, and this is what the, adult community pro vape and pro these products doesn't talk about because it's going to reduce heart disease, lung disease and all this, but they don't say anything about what happens to the teen brain. Oh, anxiety, depression, rage attacks from withdrawing. And I've seen these where kids throw computers or punch holes in walls at home or at school because the potency of these products are three and a half times greater per pod of Juul in this country than is allowed in England. Wow. However, what I've learned about what's going on in England is they've tended to skirt around this by um, the wick. It's like a candle wick that's used in this country is a silicon-based wick, whereas they use a cotton wick there. And the cotton wick absorbs more, henceforth you inhale more, of the product. So 5% is, it seems to be the level that gets kids addicted. Okay. And that's what they want to get it at, but they're not allowed to have it in England like that. So the way they try to skirt is they adjusted the nicotine to be in a cotton filament a wick 
than a silica, which is more kind of like sand. Mm -hmm. So that's why the absorption is better. So it gives closer to a 5% hit, which gives the buzz that all the kids want to get with this and gets, you know, 95% of lifetime uses of nicotine products began before the age of 21, 90% before the age of 20. Wow. So, so you know that the marketing, though they deny, is all in youth marketing in ways that are trying to avoid parents mm -hmm. knowing about it. And a classic one right now that has been used is TikTok for vaping nicotine and now vaping non-nicotine products like melatonin, essential oils, and vitamin B12, which we have no idea what that does to the lung lining. And there's no long-term evidence. It's not controlled by the FDA either. One hopes that nicotine, will, which is supposedly supposed to be controlled by the F FDA from the Family Smoking Act that Obama signed, they have failed to enforce that every single product on the market today that's e-cigarettes is illegal. They are all illegally on the market because the FDA was supposed to test and review them before they ever were on the market. And finally, they are doing it. And that's why Juul, early September, we were supposed to get an answer, but they have not given an answer about Juul at this point. So it's an all wait and see game at this point of what they're going to do with things like Juul. And Gottlieb was doubly duped by Philip Morris, and he trusted him. The second time was when Philip Morris said to him, oh, we're going to stop our vape product, Mark 10. And at the same day, time they stopped the vape product, Mark 10, they bought Juul, but they did not tell them they bought Juul. It gave the impression, short term, that they were getting out of the e-cigarette market to uh, dupe Gottlieb into thinking that they were just getting out of this harmful, these harmful products. And they weren't. In fact, they were getting deeper into it. They followed the money trail. He did. And, you know, it was, he's a real smart guy, but he just, he'd been very involved in the industry itself. But I don't think that was the answer. I, I don't know exactly why he allowed himself to be duped a second time on this. And uh, it's crazy. It's sad. Let me just introduce you. And then let's talk about how you found all of this out started to symptoms you saw from your patients, what concerns parents are bringing to you and things that you've done in Massachusetts to change legislation and change where physically the sale of vape products. And then what are things that parents can look for, you know, that, that we should as parents of teenagers, sure. are there signs sure. and symptoms and, and how can we prevent it? Lester is, and, and we gave a little bit of this, but you have been a pediatrician for 35 years and you started one practice, grew to two, yes. and now you just, you just retired. We connected over strep, but the other areas that you focus on are really the, the chronic conditions such as asthma, such as weight management, mental health eating disorders you had talked about. And then you knew that I had teenagers and you gave me tons of insights on vaping and just your connections with your pediatric patients. I was very surprised because as a man that's been, you know, 35 years older than some of these kids, these kids really open up to you. And can you just first talk about that, how you came to find that vaping was almost an epidemic, like before anyone else knew about it? I work with a, a gentleman, Jonathan Winnicock, who's a Harvard professor, and we've collaborated on this the whole time. The big thing we had focused in on after I finished my master's a year of an MPH at Harvard School of Public Health he and I combined to push Massachusetts into uh, Tobacco 21. And it took six years and 160 Board of Health meetings for me working with him and 
going through the House twice before it was passed to get that law put into place. And we were in 2019, I think it was 2018, 2019, we witnessed the House vote and we got a standing ovation from the Massachusetts House after they passed it. We both started crying. And then already vape had come out. And the big thing about the vape was the flavors, too. This was starting to come out. Let me go back. I'm sorry. There were flavors in tobacco. They were called cigarette cigarillos. You know, they were cognac. They were cherry flavored. And they were basically, this isn't the legal definition, but little cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And the problem is these were enticing to kids because of flavors. So this is where the state was involved with that, not 21. But we did 21. And then we followed with the state and helped in the flavor banning in Massachusetts. And the ban was on all flavors, including mint and menthol, which the tobacco industry had weaseled that mint is not a flavor and menthol is not a flavor. Therefore, it could stay on the market. And if you look at the the history For example, in the African-American community called Black Lives, Black Lungs, it's an incredibly devastating to see nine-year-old kids be given mentholated cigarettes. And this translated into mentholated, what started coming out in the market. And the reason it came out is they made the contention that combustible cigarettes are more dangerous than vaping so heating up a vapor vaporizing not burning a liquid was safer than the combustible cigarettes with no long-term data to prove this okay so as a result flavors came out in the form of these products as well and you know the vape industry the tobacco industry lobbied against losing flavors then compromise and say, we want menthol saved and mint. And menthol is a form of mint. So it was interesting at this point because what we noticed is the state where all these towns had passed the flavor restriction, they did not include menthol or mint. And as a result, what happened is kids just substituted and used those instead. And the rate of vaping in this state continued to rise. It was absolutely insane. I I was in Needham, the first town in the country to go to 21. Not to my credit, but was the reason I started this. Because I noticed Needham was the only town in the country and maybe the world to have gone to 21 with tobacco. And was ahead of the game in the flavors and all this stuff. All the towns around us who exempted mint and menthol seemed to, my gestalt was, increase just mint vaping and you know we had we had to get rid of that because so then that means like mango goes down but mint goes up absolutely that's just what happened because the industry pleaded with the towns please don't do this at least say mint menthol for the adults that wasn't what they were saving it for and so as a result there are all these mentholated products you know peach ice Mm -hmm. which is actually menthol ice Lush cherry, lush means mentholated, okay? Frozen cinnamon. Those are all means there's menthol in it. Oh. Let me say one thing also. Everybody knows the name Philip Morris, okay? Yep. But Philip Morris U.S. no longer exists, okay? Altria, A-L-T-R-I-A, is now former Philip Morris. My friends, I asked them, do you know what Altria is? And they have no idea. And this is the full intent is to stay clandestine with these products. Because if if parents find out it was associated with tobacco, they would not like this. So I may be getting a bit on a tangent here, and I apologize. But anyway, we pushed menthol in the flavor band for the state. And Massachusetts has the most restrictive laws in the country around vape and around tobacco and flavors, but by no means is it perfect. 
because for a while there, a lot of states around us had stopped flavors, but had not stopped mint and menthol. And the age in New Hampshire was 19. And so kids would go across the border and would go and buy a ton of menthol and mentholated vape products and bring them in to Massachusetts to sell them. And they still continue to do that, but it stopped. I wrote a letter to the governor of New Hampshire, and I don't know if it had any influence, but about a year later, these products had finally been taken off the market in New Hampshire as well. And the age was 21. What people don't realize is if the federal government enforces 21 and the state can still enforce 18 or 19, so their agents will write people up who violate at 18 or 19 and the feds in the same state if kids are under 21. So it's kind of a crazy situation. And the states have to adopt. So their they're locally funded health agents can enforce the rules that correlate with the uh, federal government. And so that's why it takes longer sometimes. It's a slower process. And we know Biden just said menthol-aided cigarettes are banned. But that's probably five to six years of litigation that's going to go on before mm -hmm. this definitely happens. And now we're into the... Um, vape because we're combustible cigarettes and not vape so um vape is still mentholated and uh and in massachusetts it's banned but around most of the country except for certain cities like san francisco a number of cities in california and in the midwest not the south which is always the troubles me because life expectancy is probably about the top 10 worst states for life expectancy at least six of them our southern states. So as a parent, how do you, how can you recognize that a child is vaping? Yeah, it's very tricky. I think the way I you do it is there are kids that get so addicted, they just suddenly start going into their rooms and have changes in their personalities. Okay. A New Zealand site claims that they get dry mouths and sore throats more. These are the common things you see when kids are starting to vape. Moodiness with families when their kids haven't been moody, which is a difficult thing to distinguish sometimes when you have adolescents. Right. But more isolated. The room may smell like pleasant, funny flavors. You know, somebody walks in and they smell this, uh, you know, it could be a, a S.E. Johnson Glade plug-in, mm -hmm. you know, something like this. And you know, the device is so small, it's easily hidden. Mm -hmm. So these are the things. I find it's mostly mood change and socialization change that really kind of triggers it for parents to know. Nowadays, people don't know it. Most of the vape products now are decentralized. They're not as much in vape shops in those parts of the country that enforce laws. But like, for example, in the South, mid in the Midwest, in parts of the West, it's not banned. So therefore, kids can go to vape shops still and get these products. Right. So as a result, you know, you've got a patchwork across the country. And there is a bill, the Polony Bill in New Jersey House of Representatives, but it's not been put to the Senate because there's too much fear that it was it's going to be not passed, partly because if they're Democrats that are um, from states that are tobacco producing, they're not going to join on board. Basically, it's the mood issues. Now, a chronic cough, you know, with it, losing weight and vomiting are key things. And those things are with nicotine and or THC. And then the final stage, which people heard about a lot before COVID, but CDC has stopped measuring this, is a valley e-cigarette associated vaping lung injury. E-V-A-L-I. And as a result, no one has any idea how much of this is going on. And I suspect the 3.6 million kids who are vaping are vaping worse now because of the pandemic. And if you vape, you have a fivefold greater chance of getting COVID as well. And these kids, they're bored. They don't have anything to do. So this is a way to stimulate themselves. And if they get depressed or they're anxious, 
they kind of self-medicate with this stuff. And I've seen that go up, even though the youth risk survey, the Center for Disease Control does CDC says it's actually gone down. It's still at epidemic levels. And the kids that are vaping are vaping daily. And getting back to Valley, there were 2000 cases in this country recorded right when the pandemic hit. Okay. Some of the pulmonologists at Boston Children's here, I've talked to feel that some of these cases that are called COVID lung disease are actually maybe vaping lung disease or mixed of vape and COVID, okay? Now, the other thing that was vaped was pot, okay? Yeah. And so people who vape nicotine often vape pot as well. And there's this whole thing where vitamin E suspension was the cause it's only in marijuana, was the cause of the Ebali lung disease, which is not true. And Juul claims it never had vitamin E in its products, yet South Korea's Department of Public Health found vitamin E in vape, which is supposedly the, the, the part that causes, damages the lungs, though we don't know that for sure. But even still, 20% of the people that they um, scoped and did washings in their lungs had no vitamin E in their lungs at all to show the damage that they had. It was just purely nicotine. So the jury's out on what's really the cause. I mean, unfortunately, I've got kids that do marijuana and they have no plans to come off of it. And it's really hit the kids now. They don't vape marijuana anymore. They're either doing edibles or they're using um, smoking. And edibles is so much easier because it doesn't smell (laughs) Huh. And as a result, that's what they're they're using much more. And, you know, I had to use a little harm reduction by saying, please don't bake. And I don't really want you using this. And I don't think it's good for your vulnerable brain right now. Right. And I've seen kids that daily vape and then have a psychotic break. And oftentimes those kids have um, schizophrenia in their family history. So it's, it's pretty scary because then you flip a kid into a disorder that may be permanent. From vaping. From vaping. Vaping marijuana in this case. Okay. But it can be not just vaping marijuana, but the brain is affected. The executive function of the brain, organization, judgment, and things like that are affected and affect the wiring of the brain. Nicotine affects the wiring of the brain. So as a result, this is why really nobody should should even be experimenting with this stuff until 25 when you're much less a sensation seeking impulsive creature and the frontal lobe is matured which has been confirmed by functional mri studies that on average the average teenage young adult kid doesn't fully develop their judgment until around 25 and that's what the car and rental industry said they basically looked at it from a more practical viewpoint when the brain neuroscientists ask, why did you make 25 the cutoff to when you can start renting cars? And of course, you can rent them earlier now, but you got to pay a lot more right? because of risk. And why did you do that? I said, it's simple. Our crash rates don't significantly drop until 25. Right. So as a result, optimal judgment isn't reached until about 25. And we put kids behind the wheel at 16. And that is controversial, but that's what we do. And The simple thing, the thing that's amazing about brain maturation in Massachusetts, they finally said, delayed by six months, your ability to drive somebody else other than your parents. And when they did that, they had a 25% reduction in highway deaths in teenagers as a result of waiting just those six months and let the brain ripen, as they say. Yep. This was a huge. I mean, this is why the longer you wait, the better the brain matures. Sure. Just because you can go to war doesn't mean that you have optimal judgment. In fact, sometimes people who don't have optimal judgment will just follow orders better. Yeah. And in some cases, this is a huge problem. My nephew started smoking and his two-month-old kid died of SIDS. I begged him not to smoke in front of his kid. I wasn't listened to, and I saw him carrying his 
in his full dress blues, carrying a little white coffin in his arms to the burial site. Oh. And, you know, this is something that's always been in the back of my mind why I've done this, I think. The team at Checkable Medical is famously fussy about what goes into their bodies. Optimal health at every stage and every age is key to living a life you love. Choose better supplements with superior ingredients in simple, easy-to-absorb formats that fit into your daily life. Feel your best with Checkable Wellness. If you're ready to get started, check out CheckableWellness.com for more details. Your healthcare begins at home. So if parents want information, I think go to the Truth Initiative or Tobacco-Free Kids. Okay. All the information about how to quit, how to talk to my child in a non-judgmental way. See, most parents I see come in with their kids have just caught them with it and become so upset and angry at the kids for doing it. But the issue here is if we don't talk in a non-judgmental way, they're going to shut down. Yeah. Instead of just you know, grounding you said, tell me what's appealing to you about it. Tell me how you feel when you use it. Right. Okay. Get used to talking about those kind of things, you know, about and where do you do it? When do you do it? Why do you do it at that time? You know, it's interesting. Most of the kids I see, for example, using marijuana, use it at bedtime, towards bedtime, because they said it's, I use it to help me sleep. Okay. And now that's why they're vaping melatonin. <laughs> yeah. And we don't know how safe that is because it's not regulated at all. Is there still such a thing as puffer lung? Popcorn lung, diacetyl. Yes. That's not what we're seeing with the valley e-cigarette vaping lung injury, though. That's the diacetyl, the popcorn lung. We're not really seeing that, but the vitamin E is the one that's being used. I mean, there's one kid in Detroit, he, his lungs were so damaged, he had to have a bilateral lung transplant. Oh, my gosh. I have had some Valley kids, and they, they get on steroids, and they gain 30 to 60 pounds from Ooh. puffing up on steroids because if they go off the steroids, they can't breathe. <laughs> so it's a real catch-22, and their body image is destroyed. I had one fellow, definitively know this, but there's a nasal pharyngeal cancer that usually the onset is at the earliest is age 40. He vaped THC and nicotine for three years and he had a nasal, that nasal pharyngeal cancer he developed. And we have no idea. It's really, this is what upsets me to no end about this basic assumption by some of the UK and some of the, uh, public health people in this country, that it's safer than cigarettes. We have absolutely no long-term evidence, zero, zilch, yeah. that this is the case. Short-term, maybe a little that may show a difference, but we have nothing 20 years out, 30 years out, 40 years out. So all the people who are vaping now are lab rats of the future. And it's just what the industry did, tobacco did, at the turn into the 20th century. And this is what we're seeing again. And this is why, you know, parent groups called PAY, Parents Against Vaping E-Cigarettes, is a fantastic group out of New York. And the Meredith Berkman, Dorian Furman are just, they're rabid mothers, I say, jokingly. <laughs> I say, and, and they talk about, you mess with the wrong moms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know them, I've worked with them, and I feel they're a very legitimate organization that takes the science mm -hmm. and really looks at the science of this. And um, they've had sons, they've both been addicted. I don't think they, it's either of them, but there's a story of a kid who was inhaling it so much that they seized from nicotine. Awful. And there are now new devices on the market called Puff Bar and Crave, C-R-A-V-E, and Hide. And some of them have 3,500 puffs, which is equivalent to somewhere between six to eight packs of cigarettes. Wow. And the concerning thing about that is there's no signal to an endpoint. In other words, when a cigarette, you smoked it, you had 20 puffs and that was it. Then you had to light up again. This doesn't do that. And you'll see kids, mm -hmm. 
you know, every I've counted every, kids every five seconds inhaling another one wow. and another one and another one. And they can easily go a pod is a pack of cigarettes a day. And I've seen kids get two to four pods a day. What? And so, you know, this is, this is, they become so addicted. I mean, this was, this was so many years ago. They had done a, a study on mice because in the seventies, when all the CEOs of the tobacco companies were brought before the Senate and Wyden said to them, answer this question, yes or no. Do you think nicotine is addictive? And they all said, no. They all said no. Now, when they do this again, now they say yes. And we're trying to help people get off. And how they found out how addictive it is, they started in Louisiana. There was a a lawyer who had been involved somehow in the research. And they had taken lab rats and they made nicotine pills or liquid. And every time the rat would hit this lever, some of the nicotine liquid would come out and they drink it. And it was really something what you'd see is these lab rats just taking their hand and just beating it. Boom, 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 boom. And, and, you know, to say they weren't addicted was crazy. And the lawyer in his Cajun voice said, Ooh, we got a lawsuit. So, and that was the tobacco settlement in Louisiana. Part of it, which was about $250 million paid over a certain time period. But this is, this is the issue. And now it's going into these products like tobacco-free nicotine that are synthetic, supposedly not taken from the tobacco plant. And Puff Bars is trying to get their product cleared. This can be used. It's not a problem. It's safe. It's not safe to the teenage brain. Nicotine is not safe to the teenage brain. Right. It wires them into addiction. It increases their risk of using other drugs. It may have cancer-causing agents themselves. It affects the elasticity of your arteries, it increases, hence increases risk of strokes. And it also raises your blood pressure, which we don't know long-term what that does. Plus these products have propylene glycol, which we don't know what that'll do. And one of the books I read, you know, um, The Devil's Playbook, they have a section when they took about 24 beagle puppies and they had them inhale propylene glycol liquid for 28 days, then sacrificed them for their lungs and looked at their lungs. They said, oh, there was some hemorrhaging in the lungs, but it's insignificant. And I'm saying, you only did 28 days, okay? Right. I mean, how are you going to have, you can't draw any conclusion from a 28-day study. And this is part of the problem is the FDA tells these people to do the research you know, the Philip Morris and things like that. Yeah. They found, I mean, Jules doctored their own research. Yeah. You know, the other things in these products are heavy metals. There's lead, chromium, nickel, and things like that. These agents are lung carcinogens. And they also, because they're heavy metals, will affect the neurological development of children. So this is, we think, this means that an infant who inhales the secondhand vape, or because it's an oily based, you know, propane glycol and vegetable oil, it coats the furniture, coats the floor, and the kid crawls on the floor and they put their hand in their mouth and they're getting what we would consider low levels of cadmium, nickel, lead, and chromium. But for these kids, it's just like lead. It's toxic. Right. So we don't we don't know the long-term effects of this. So as a result, our infants are lab rats as well with parents that vape, vape marijuana or nicotine. And so this is a deep concern. All this stuff was put out on the market and it wasn't supposed to be allowed. It was during the Obama administration when they were distracted by the Family Smoking Act. Mm-hmm. And everybody celebrated this. The industry was light years beyond them looking at the vape products already and looking at ways they could get it through the FDA, get it out there in the market without having the FDA bother them. And this is the key thing. This is a philosophy of big vape and also the philosophy of Silicon Valley. You know, 
do what you want to do and apologize later. Mm -hmm. And that has been the issue with big tobacco and big vape. And the people who developed Juul were from Silicon Valley. Right. They're Silicon Valley guys. I mean, they're geniuses, but they said they were out to save a billion people in the United the world from, you know, dying from tobacco related diseases, which in this country is the most preventable cause of death. 450,000 people die a year from tobacco related diseases, lung and heart. But there are also 50,000 people a year die on average who inhale secondhand smoke. Wow. And we don't know what secondhand vape's going to do. And I have a close relative who has bladder cancer. And the only thing I can think about is this person's father was a three pack a day smoker. Oh, no way. Yeah. So there are people who get cancer from secondhand smoke. And as I saw this kid, I, I worry about kids having, and none of this stuff's going to come out. I mean, the average age, somebody has an onset of cancer if they smoke is 70. Yeah. Only like 70. And then the average age with heart disease and stroke, they may start signing signs at 56. So in their late 50s. But that that means they have to go a long time before we see this. And that's why none of this stuff should be allowed in the market. Because there is no long-term study to show it's any better. Yep. It's going to take time to get things off the market. So if you're a parent, though, things that we should look for, packaging, the names of things, looking in pockets. What are some of the tips that you... Well, there are things you can look at about if you're hiding jewel in a kid's room. There are actually things like, you know, those cube gums you can buy in, at the grocery store that come in, uh, you know, 60, you know, chew, chewing gums. They have fake bottoms. For those well they'll put jewel pods but now they're not doing jewel pods so much because pods that are coming on and off replaceable you can't do by the way let me also say something reading about tobacco kids were referred to as replacement customers okay oh. that's what they call and they call them the sticky customers as well sticky means they're addicted so this is how they use their language as well but anyway Going back to that, I think you can look in the room. You can you can also, one of the things I think parents should join paid, they have the world's experts come on. You should go through the podcasts. And I think parents of African-American descent should look at that and parents who are not of African-American descent, to be quite frank. Yeah. Black Lives, Black Lungs. It's only 15 minutes long, but it's a real eye opener of how they treated the African-American kids, because it's somewhere between 90 and 98 percent of African-American kids that use tobacco products, use mentholated tobacco products because they're so strongly marketed to in this country. And we have also seen a 30 percent increase in quit rate in adults in Canada, they found when they took menthol out of cigarettes. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Because menthol's purpose is to numb the back of your throat to allow the harshness of a cigarette to be tolerated. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was also used with kids. But also, I think it goes back to smell. And I just think the mood of a kid, there isn't many signs and symptoms. But I think going through the room, and your kid may have a text number to a, a nicotine drug pusher, and text them and they say they meet downtown, you know, yeah downtown in a center or square in a little town or something and the guy drives up you give him the money he gives you he gives you the packages of nicotine and it should be parents in a community working together you know oh i saw johnny out there there's this car that drove up and i couldn't see what he handed him but he handed him something and then he was given something back imagine a parent's friend who just happened to be driving in the area and sees it you report it to the parents, you tell tell them what's going on. We're not going to tolerate this. Wow. Yeah. Making sure that packaging that comes to the house, that you know what's coming in the house, okay? Yeah. Because some of these kids will wait around till the package shows up and then grab it, and uh, you won't know. And some of these kids used to go to New Hampshire or here and have a mailbox in New Hampshire. And they would order oh, things wow. and put it in their mailbox. Get it. Kids are very smart. Yeah. And, you know, 
the thing that I often deal with is the parents being surprised kids have used this. Okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, in some school systems, 50% of the kids fake. Come on. You know, Jeez. I don't care who the kid is. They don't have optimal judgment at, at 14, 15, and 16. And they want to be included with their friends. Right. And all of us were as guilty of this. And that's yeah. what we have to say, say back then, too. You know, when I talked to kid, my judgment was impaired at this age. Your mother's judgment was impaired. And your dad was probably a little bit more because men are stupider. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I say to him. But, but uh, it's true. And I think that, you know, the assumptions should be, oh, my kid doesn't do this because they're a good kid. This is not a good kid, bad thing issue. This is something that an industry promotes. And one in four to one in three kids who try nicotine products in vape form will become addicted will become addicted and they're targeting our kids bottom line is they're marketing to the kids the flavors are to the kids jewel was totally marketing to the kids even though they were running clinicals as a smoking cessation they're marketing which they were spending millions hundreds of millions of dollars yep to market to our kids yep and the reality is that these vape shops are doing the same thing. And these manufacturers are doing the same things. And Absolutely. big tobacco is too. So as parents, we really do need to talk to our kids about these things. And some of the things that you said. In first grade, this is not something you wait until the kids in middle school or high school. This is starting in first grade. Yep. We have an industry of addiction. Alcohol, marijuana, nicotine, nicotine, and opioids, and they profit off getting your kids hooked. And I would say caffeine too, wouldn't you? Like some of those. Yes, to a point, but nothing like these, you know, nothing like these other products. Overusing caffeine, there can be trouble, but we don't have any data showing you get cancer, you get sure. heart disease and lung disease from it. Yeah. You know, and so as a result, we need to protect our kids because even the government, SAMHSA, S A M S H A, which is a governmental website on addiction, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dr. Nora Volkow runs it and she's very eloquent, talks about the addiction industries. And how they prey on younger kids where the brains are vulnerable to addiction. And that's why if you're talking to a kid in fifth grade, it's too late. It's almost too late. Yeah. You know, you got to start earlier. The thing I wish schools would do is start a curriculum in kindergarten on brain health. Okay. You want six pack abs? Don't you want a six pack brain? Yeah. You know, yeah. Because this is the thing that's bothersome to me there's no science curriculum until you get to third grade in this country which is a travesty to me and i think if they want to start with something it's brain health yeah these are things that are going to mess your brain up these are the things that are going to cause you problems and the younger you try them the more likely you get addicted and i've had 11 and 12 year olds in my practice hooked on these products as well though the advertising has reduced it's still happening and it's happening by closed doors and bedrooms during the virtual visits and all this. There were, oh my God, um, puff bars had all this stuff in advertising that looked like, you know, getting pesky texts from your parents. Yeah. Take a break. Get a few puffs of your, um, your puff bar. Oh my gosh. Really? Yep. Yep. Ugh. Maura Healy, Massachusetts, when they raided Jewel headquarters, when finally um, Gottlieb got somewhat smart, but still continued to be duped. Maura Healy got about 50,000 pages of marketing strategy, and there wasn't a single page on getting adults off nicotine. It was all about getting youth on nicotine. Oh, my gosh. That's so bad. They lie. Yes. I mean, no stockholder-driven company should be left unregulated. Yeah. I mean, and I'll say this, you want to go to an unregulated place, come to Haiti with me. Okay. Where there's no tax base, there's no nothing. And it's all left to people that are poor and are not educated properly with no advancement. That's why we got all these people under the bridge in Texas right now is because they have 
no regulation of government. And there's a very wealthy subset of people, very, very wealthy versus 80, 90% of people there live off about a dollar a day at most. Part of this is the fact that we don't regulate. Massachusetts is in the top four or five in life expectancy. Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Georgia are in the bottom five, you know, and West Virginia. And so when you see all this stuff, I always talk about life expectancy because I don't think politicians talk about life expectancy. Mm -hmm. They always talk about money, but nobody's saying, don't you want to live in a state you have a better life expectancy? Yeah. And Minnesota is very good too, by the way. Yeah. But there are a lot of Midwest states that aren't so good. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Missouri, Mm -hmm. Wisconsin, you know, aren't the strongest states with this. So yeah. People think government overreach. Well, do you want to live a little bit longer? I mean, the difference between Louisiana and Massachusetts is about three or four years cut off in life expectancy. Hmm. It's even worse when you smoke. It's 10 years cut off. Yeah. So that's integrated into this. And not everybody smokes. And that's why it's not 10 years. This is what people don't realize. If the goal is you want to live longer and healthier life. This means regulations that help. And this was regulations in Massachusetts started in Paul Revere's time. Wow. This is stuff that's been in Massachusetts since then. It's unique in Massachusetts. Every town determines its own health destiny. So the advantage to that is you can go to all these little towns and work with them instead of trying to go at a state level where they've been hooked in with big tobacco as much. It doesn't mean big tobacco doesn't reach down to the small towns. because I fought in 160 meetings. I fought so many of them and uh, lawyers that would come in and I'd say, how much are you getting paid for doing this? And they'd look at me and they wouldn't say, but they did. They said, this is how much I get. I put up my hands, zero. So yeah. I would start in the moral high ground because these people are terrible. What they're doing is terrible because they're not looking at what the harm they're doing because it's not my kid. Right. This is the horrors about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it starts with being educated. Absolutely. We will post on social media as well as our website a lot of these different references that you have talked about today. It really is about being an advocate for your child and Absolutely. doing and, and educating them early. Lily, who is mine in fifth grade, never too early to talk about these things. So I think that's a huge thing that I need to do a better job at talking with her about these and that it's not glamorous. And show them product. Don't just talk. They need to see the pictures of these things mm-hmm. as well. I mean, let me just tell you, the most indicting thing to a convenience store that sells us and to the to to the um, distributors is the product itself. Okay. And I bring all the products with me. Here's a bag okay. up. Yeah. I bring them and I pass them around. And any lawsuit that somebody has should be passing these around to the jury so they can look at it because this is the hard evidence that you mm-hmm. need. And I'm not saying buy one so your kid can see it. Just look at pictures mm-hmm. with it. Mm-hmm. So anyway, and talk to your pediatrician. They may not be the source. They might be the source to help you because there's a lot of problems with, you know, success with, you know, patch and gum, but it's not not worth trying. It's just off-label use if your kids are under 18. Yeah. So um, yeah. that's, that's the challenge. But people should look up online. You have texting. They can text your kid daily on addiction things you know, check in with them. And this is no cost. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important that parents, if they know their kids dueling or suspect it, see if your children's hospital, if you have one locally, has a clinic for vaping. Boston Children's now, there's a vaping clinic and there's the um, adolescent substance abuse clinic. And Children's Boston is the first hospital in the country to develop a pediatric addiction fellowship. Wow. So pediatricians can subspecialize in addiction. This is the first place in the United States and maybe the world. And Sharon Levy, L-E-V-Y, is the one who started the program. 
Okay. She's great. Really good resource. Well, thank you so much, Lester. Just, and thank you for your dedication and just seeing this through. And like you said, you're not racking up a bill to um, be the advocate for kids that this is really because it affected you years and years ago. Like you said, your nephew and it's things that cause generational differences, you know, behavior that can affect us generationally. So thank you so much for joining me. And it's my ticket to heaven in addition to my wife. So yes, yes. Well, thank you, Lester. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the We Podcast as much as us. If you want more wellness goodies, head over to the wellnessessentialspodcast.com for show notes, links, and resources mentioned in today's podcast. Remember to hit subscribe on your favorite podcast platform to get all the wellness details as soon as they are released. Cheers to living your healthiest and happiest life.